Hey Flower Tribe, it's Kelly Lehman from Cranberry Fields Flower Farm and I wanted to take you guys on an October tour through my secret garden. So I'm going to show you the good, the bad and the ugly. So this time of year, uh, a lot of the plants are going dormant and I've got a lot of weeds back here and I want to show you just um, some of the steps that I take in my fall garden to kind of help it flourish uh, in spring and in summer. So I'm going to show you some of um, the blunders that I made today. I'm going to show you some of the things I'm proud of and I'm going to show you some great tips to help you with your own garden. So if you guys can, uh, just let me know um, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up or uh, let me have a little comment to let me know where you're viewing this from. Just like the state or the country, I love to see how our flower tribe is growing around the globe. Each week, it's so exciting. There were so many of you, and um, I'd like to invite you to join us over on my Kelly Lehman's Flower Tribe YouTube. Um, I'm sorry, my Kelly Lehman's Flower Tribe Facebook group because there's like 4,000 gardeners from all over the world, and they're posting pictures of their own beautiful flowers, and they're posting tons of garden questions and tons of garden answers there. So it's a terrific place to meet up with other gardeners, swap tips, get some great advice, and I appreciate all of you that are showing up over there and offering a lot of your garden expertise. You guys are a wealth of knowledge. Hey, Francis, thank you for checking in. You're viewing from West Virginia. Nice. How's the weather by you? It's beautiful here in Cranberry, New Jersey. It's probably about 75 degrees, sunny. So it's a perfect fall day here. So we needed this. I'm in a planting zone uh, six. So this is my hardiness zone is six. And guys, it's really important to know what your planting hardiness zone is. And you can find that um, just by going, you could do a Google search and you can just Google search uh, USDA planting zone or USDA hardiness zone. And it'll pop up, um, like a website will populate that you can just add your zip code to and it will tell you what your planting zone is. And that kind of helps you when you're picking out plants. It helps you know the plants that are going to thrive in your neck of the woods. And um, you can also ask the people at your local garden centers because you know they'll let you know. But I have to say most of the time I find that the plants that are being sold in your local garden centers and your local Home Depots and Lowe's, those are usually the plants that are best for your planting hardiness zone. However, a lot of people are buying a lot of plants online. So like sometimes you'll buy something from Amazon and it's shipped. And um, those you really wanna make sure that you know uh, what is the best planting zone because you know the, the people at Amazon have no idea what the best plant is for your area So you don't want to wind up buying plants that will not thrive uh, in your area So um, that's my advice with the whole planting hardiness zone So I want to start off by showing you my pinky winky hydrangea I'm in a different part of the garden than I usually show you guys So I'm hoping my Wi-Fi is going to hold out um, if for some reason, uh, you know, it kind of falters, I will try to get back to a better Wi-Fi. But right now, I think we're good. Um, so this is my Pinky Winky. It's a gorgeous hydrangea. I planted this gal in the ground, I'd say probably about maybe 10, 12 years ago. And I literally neglect the heck out of this plant. I put it in the ground. I don't even water it most of the time. So Mother Nature takes care of the watering. It thrives and gets larger and more beautiful every single year. I don't fertilize it. I do do a little bit of mulch and I will do a little bit of compost uh, each year and that kind of helps the soil out and I think that that helps a lot with the water retention. Here's Lucy. I don't know if you guys have met Lucy yet, but this is my Bernese Mountain Dog. She's always out here with me. And so this is a really great hydrangea if you're looking for a low maintenance, beautiful, large shrub. Now it took a while to get this big. So um, it wasn't this big. Uh, I'd say probably the first three or four years, it was probably only about maybe like maybe three feet tall and, you know, obviously not this wide, but I want to show you the petals. They're really beautiful. They're this bright, bright red right now. You know, I guess that hence the name Pinky Winky. And they started out as a beautiful creamy white. So this is like a really great low maintenance hydrangea for your garden. And um, the thing I find though is I like to also tell you guys about the fresh cut flower aspect of the flowers that you grow in your garden. I don't find that it has a great vase life. So when I cut these blooms and they're white, I find that they kind of poop out in the vase like, you know, really fast. And I find that when I cut them in this beautiful pink stage, I'll get a few days of, you know, like, like beautiful vase life, but then it, they, they kind of turn dark. They turn like a browner color. So um, it's actually a really cool look if you're doing like an October Halloween theme because they do get kind of deep and dark. Um, so you might want to try those out. I really like them though, but once again, it's really, really low maintenance. I've got a hydrangea in the back 
that I always thought was Pinky Winky. And you guys, you know, you, you, you have so much knowledge in the garden. Does anyone know if this is also a Pinky Winky? It might actually be a pink diamond. So this is just a very similar look. If you'll notice, uh, these have cone-shaped flowers as well as my Pinky Winky, but I'm trying to be like a little bit of a garden detective here. And I mean, these plants look so different right now. So if I look at, I'm gonna try to show you both together. So these plants, if they were the same variety, they should be looking a little more like each other. Unless this guy might just be a little bit younger than this one. I don't remember if I planted this one a few years uh, before, but I have a feeling this is pink diamond. So I'm gonna take a walk closer to this. These blooms eventually turn very, very red, just like the, um, you know, the one in back of me. So I don't know if this is just a more mature pinky winky or if this is that pink diamond. Hey guys. Hey, um, I'm gonna to try to say your name this time. I know every week I, I mess it up. Zeke mom, <laughs> Zeke mommy, <laughs> thank you for checking in. I love seeing you here each week. And thank you for all of you guys that show up at 1030 every Thursday. I try to post a live video on this channel, uh, 1030 every Thursday. But I have to say guys, I'm gonna be switching that starting next week to Wednesdays at 1030. So I'll put a lot of, um, oh, it's out of focus. Okay, let me back up. Heather, thank you for that. Because on my camera, it looks like it's clear. How do you guys see everything now? Are we good? Are we back, back good in focus? I'm gonna back up a bit because I think my Wi-Fi might be better over here. So here's Lucy hanging out underneath uh, a Wygela plant. Sometimes, I used to say Wygalia, which is wrong, but it's, I think the pronunciation is um, Wygela. And so let's see, you just, let me see. Just call you Z. Okay, Z, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, Z, fair enough. All right, so Lucy's underneath this uh, Wygela plant. And I love this plant because I use it for a lot of my greens in my uh, flower arrangements. So I'll use this. It has beautiful um, like wine colored flowers in the spring. It's a great uh, green plant for your garden and it is a, a great flower uh, to grow for as far as like the greens for the fillers. The flowers themselves don't have a great base life, but I use the heck out of these to fill out um, the arrangements all around them. And I want to show you what my dahlia looks like right now. So I'm not sure if you guys, um, you know, know that the simple tip about keeping your dahlias blooming all season long, right up to the frost. So this dahlia I planted, I think in June. And the basic rule of thumb is you just come in here and you give it a deadhead. I do a lot of, a lot of times I'll just do it with my finger. I'll come in here, you find a fresh set of leaves and you just give it a little snip. So you give it like a little bit of a deadhead. And sometimes, especially after there's some water, it's hard to do that. So you might want to just like grab a scissor. But if you get rid of those deadheads, it encourages more blooms to come up. So I'm hoping that I'm going to have more flowers all the way through like, you know, the end of October, November. So I love those flowers that you plant in the ground and they give you like months and months of blooms. So that's really important to me. I want low maintenance, high blooming plants. So I try to show you a lot of those. And, um, I'm going to come over here to my endless summer. A lot of you have asked me about those spots that you're seeing on your hydrangeas this time of year, especially if you're in like a, like a more northern climate. So here's the story with those guys. Sometimes uh, temps just start to dip and there's some moisture on the plant. And uh, this is what's going to happen this time of year. Some people call them like little cranberry freckles. I don't worry too much about them. And I definitely would not start chopping all these leaves off unless you know that it's a fungal disease. So you might want to bring one of these branches to your local garden center. And um, you know, you can ask them, hey, is this just like that you know, seasonal spotting or is it a fungal disease? Because if it's you know, really big spots and it seems like your plant's failing, you might need to treat it. But for the most part, this is just what hydrangeas do at this time of year. And if you come in here and you start like hacking off all of these leaves, you're gonna start cutting off next year's flowers. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, there's some little tiny, like little nodes over here. These are gonna be next year's blooms. So if you came in here and you started like hacking away all of these spotted leaves and you started cutting back all these stems, you're going to be cutting off next year's bloom. So I would hold off on that. And uh, uh, other people have asked me, well, you know, I want to make some dried flower arrangements, uh, but, you know, I don't want to cut off next year's bloom. So the secret to that is to just take some of the flower heads that have kind of dried out. And there's always some like real beauty on the bottom of these endless summers and you could just cut them short. So just make some like shorter flower arrangements. As long as you go, don't, don't go all the way down on the stem, you should be okay. And then don't cut off like every single bloom that you see on the plant, just cut off a couple of them. 
Uh, oh, thanks for checking in from Sweden. Nice. Wow, I love to see you guys all over the place. So back here, uh, I don't want to walk too much. Tell me if I go out of focus again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push uh, the envelope right now and see how far I can get. I've got a butterfly bush back there. It's purple. And I've been deadheading this. Uh, all summer long and I'm hoping to have blooms the same thing with that plant until uh, the frost comes and I've got beautiful monarch butterflies back here this time. Good morning. Hey Frank, how are you? Always nice to see you. We've got some lavender back here. We've got three or four lavender plants on the bottom and um, Sheldon built this beautiful table over here a while ago. Him and his friend Dave uh, they kind of recycled some wood pallets and, and he even painted the, the sunflower on it. Isn't that cool? But on this table, I wanted to show you one of my um, hydrangea stems that I've been trying to uh, take a shot at propagating. And so what's really nice about this stem is I know that it's growing because it's got some fresh leaves on it. So I cut this stem from the plant probably about, I don't know, like four or five weeks ago. And I'm starting to see signs of roots down here. So there's some roots coming off the bottom. I know it's a little blurry. Uh, let me try to put it in the water. Maybe you can see it in the water better. But there are roots that are coming from the bottom of this plant. Can you kind of see it in the water a little bit better? I'll kind of rotate it around. And I have a whole series on uh, propagating your hydrangea plants. So you're going to take your plants and you can make like a lot more from the plants that you have in your garden. You could take a look at uh, some of my um, Hydrangea playlists, I have them linked in descriptions below, and I also have them in a lot of my live videos. So check out all those propagation uh, ideas because they're really fun. And um, I'd like to thank an anonymous donor for today's cup of caffeine. If you guys ever want to buy me a cup of coffee, uh, you can take a look in descriptions below. I appreciate that. Thank you for your support. It means a lot. And if you don't, don't worry. I'm still going to give you these uh, great garden tips every week. I appreciate you guys following me. And the comments are amazing. And um, the thumbs up, it just helps with the algorithm. So I appreciate the support, guys. I've got some tall grasses back here that I love. I love tall grasses. They really seem to like fluff out. Uh, your garden. So if you have a larger garden space or like a larger uh, landscaping plan in the front of your house or in the back of your house and you just want like a, like a great no, low maintenance like filler, I would go with these um, tall garden grasses. They're amazing. I usually leave mine in place in the fall. I like to provide a little bit of protection for some of like the birds and some of the smaller animals. So I'll leave them in place. Uh, other people like to cut them back um, to make them a little bit neater because they do get floppy. They'll get kind of floppy, you know, with, uh, with the rain and the snow. Uh, but what I'll usually do is I'll leave them in place and then I will prune them back in early spring, like late winter, early spring. We just come in here with a chainsaw. I, I say we, but it's Sheldon. Sheldon comes in here with a chainsaw and he just hacks it down. But a great tip for uh, cutting back your grasses is to tie them up first with like a bungee cord or a piece of rope. So if you can kind of lift all these um, stems off the ground, if you can kind of lift them up nice and high, it makes it so much easier when you're doing the hacking. And then you just kind of cut it from the base. I'll usually leave about two or three, I'll, I'll leave about two feet um, like intact in and the rest of it we just cut down. And so that's like my little grass tip here. So who else do I have back here that I want to show you? I want to show you my echinacea, uh, other, you know, it's coneflower. And um, my girlfriend Susie sent me these seeds a while ago. So she's the best. She sent me like a whole bunch in a bouquet. Um, it was actually some dried out uh, ones that looked like this. It was the best, one of the best bouquets I've ever gotten. So I sent her a flower bouquet that had a, a, you know, like burlap wrapped. It was really beautiful, fresh flowers. She saved the burlap wrap. She saved like the craft paper and the bow. And she gave me a huge bouquet of dried echinacea. She sent it back. And now I've got beautiful echinacea all over my garden because of these seeds. And it was literally one of my favorite flower bouquets that I've ever gotten. It's such a cute gift idea. So consider that guys, even for like a Christmas present, you know, to kind of wrap up a little bouquet like this of some of like the seeds, uh, that would be really cool. I got, oh, oh, I just like slapped one of my honeybees with the stem. Sorry about that guy. So that's what the echinacea looks like. Um, I will leave these guys in my garden and I will let them self seed themselves. Or I'll take like a handful of them when they're at this stage and I'll wind up just kind of you know, putting them in the ground now. It's a good time. Uh, they they kind of like to, to be in the ground now. I, I would not wait until spring to plant these guys. For some reason, echinacea, I think, needs kind of like that cold and it needs to kind of, um, I think it might need the stratification, which is like when it needs to kind of have like a period of cold. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure 
because it's usually a good idea to kind of get those kind of in the ground at this time of year instead of holding off. Like my, my sunflower seeds and my zinnias, those gals, I'll save those seeds, dry them out, and I'll put those in the ground uh, right after Mother's Day when the, when the ground warms up. But the echinacea is kind of a different story. And then here I've just got like another hydrangea. And guys, these guys are like very close to the plant next to it. So this is like a great time of year to move your plants. So once they start going dormant, once temperatures start to kind of cool off and they're no longer blooming, it's a great time to move your plants. As long as you have at least six weeks before the ground freezes. And the ground freeze is very different than a frost. So a frost might come and hit us in like two or three weeks, but that doesn't mean that my ground's frozen. So it's still safe to plant. So it really takes, I think it takes like maybe five days of like, you know, constant, super, super, super cold weather for that ground to freeze. So if you wanted to plant some things in your garden and, and in your landscaping, and you're like, oh, but we just had a frost, I missed my window. You really didn't miss the window. You just, you know, you, you want six weeks before that ground is frozen. And a lot of times in fall, like we'll get a frost and then things warm up for a couple more weeks. So you're, you're probably still good to go. And now's a great time to put all your bulbs in the ground. So put your daffodils in the, ball, in the ground now, your tulips. Now is the best time to plant um, some of your peony tubers and you can plant your, um, you know, like your allium bulbs. So do those fall bulb plantings now and then you'll have gorgeous spring flowers. So that's this neck of the woods over here. I'm gonna to try to walk you back. Here's my limelight hydrangea. I love this plant. A lot of you have asked me about pruning. The only parts of this um, uh, plant that I will kind of like start doing a little bit of, and it's definitely not pruning because you don't want to prune your hydrangeas in fall. I would always wait until the end of winter or early spring uh, for most varieties. These guys come in on what's called new growth. So, you know, I don't really have to worry too much about cutting off next year's blooms because these guys come in on brand new growth that starts in spring. But I don't want to prune them back now because I don't want to kickstart like a growth spurt. And so what I will do, though, is I'll start making gorgeous flower arrangements out of these beautiful flower heads that are semi dry because they're going to dry out to like a gorgeous flower. And so these guys, I'll just like cut off, you know, like a few of them. We've been making them like crazy because I have about 30 of these plants all around the place. So limelight hydrangea is spectacular. So I love this bloom. So I'll give these guys, especially like these really heavy heads, some of them I'll make arrangements out of. Others of them that are like really large, I'll do a deadheading, like in winter, just because I don't want to crack off those stems. I don't want those stems cracking from the weight of the snow. So that's kind of like my limelight hydrangea tip. And I just got more grasses there. I'm going to walk you back this way. I'm going to try to go slow so that internet doesn't go. And guys, I made... um three online flower courses for you and they're going to make a great gift for Christmas for the gardeners in your life and it basically shows you how to grow uh, beautiful perennial flowers like these for a fresh cut flower garden and the second course shows you how to grow beautiful annual flowers for your fresh cut flower garden and the third one's going to teach you how to arrange all those beautiful flowers so you can check that out in links below they're my three flower guides and I'm going to walk slow again because I don't want to I think that's the key so that you don't lose connection so let's keep going back, super, super slow. More of these limelight hydrangeas. I can't like emphasize enough how much I love this plant. Once again, this is kind of like that pinky winky um, because I basically planted this thing like 15 years ago and I hardly ever do anything to it. I don't fertilize it. I do a little bit of mulch. You can tell I've got some mulch like on the bottom. I like to keep in that moisture and, um, but a little bit of compost, a little bit of mulch and that's it. And this time of year, guys, is a good time to add some compost to the soil, add some mulch, but uh, I wouldn't fertilize. Um, I think most um, people that have hydrangeas do the trick of, you know, you don't want to fertilize this time of year because you don't want to kickstart that growth cycle. You don't want to have those new flowers blooming. And a lot of times that's what the fertilizers do. So unless, you know, your garden expert told you, you know, differently, I would stick with composting your hydrangeas this time of year, a little bit of organic, you know, compost mixed in with the soil. And then you can just do a light layering of uh, mulch just to kind of keep that moisture in and to keep the roots kind of tucked in for the summer. And so let's see. Um, Z, you said you have a huge limelight outside your kitchen window. You love it. I know. I love them. Here's um, a daylily, and I love these. These are also super easy to grow. These do not have uh, any type of vase life. They literally last in the vase for one day, 
before they fall apart. And I'm curious if that's the reason why it has the name Daylily. But it's beautiful in your garden. Uh, they get a little bit bigger every year. They kind of spread out, super easy to grow. I think they're drought tolerant, I'm almost positive, uh, but I have a lot of these in my garden and I love them. These guys sprouted up on their own. I think they're weeds, but I don't care. I like them and I use them in some of my flower arrangements. Guys, you'd be shocked if you really walk around your garden and you take a look at some of the things that are out there that people consider weeds and you, sometimes they're just absolutely stunning. So like a lot of times we'll use like Queen Anne's lace and some people think that that's a weed. I use it all the time and it's absolutely beautiful. We'll even use like some of our peony leaves that are kind of turning like red and like a little bit of like a rust color because it's the end of the season and they look striking. They look really, really, really beautiful. So here's like one of my roses over here and this is one of my climbers. So I like to have a lot of height in my garden I like to have different layers, different stacking, and I like to have flowers that have different bloom periods. And what I mean by that is that these peonies in the front of the garden here, right now it's just the green, but these were like big fluffy Sarah Bernhardt, um, you know, flowers way back in like May and June. So these peonies and double daffodils and tulips um, alliums, they took over this entire garden in the beginning of spring. And then when all of those died out, then my black eyed Susans, which are kind of front and center here, they were like bright, bright, bright yellow. They took over for the entire summer. And then my limelight hydrangeas, which you see all over here, they kind of took over, you know, towards the end of summer. And um, now it's going to be this color in fall, which is terrific. So consider like different bloom periods. Um, and, and when things are coming up when you're planning out your garden. And in those courses, I give you like a whole little roadmap to how to plan out your fresh cut flower garden with some really easy, simple steps. And so, yeah, so that's it. So I'm gonna leave these uh, Black Eyed Susans in place because they're huge self seeders. So instead of hacking them back right now, I'm gonna let them continue to dry out and they're gonna wind up, a lot of these are gonna wind up dropping to the ground on their own and they're going to self-seed. And then every year I've got a ton of extra Black Eyed Susan plants and it basically just takes over, the, you know, the, the entire bottom of this garden and then I don't have to weed it so much. And who else is back here? I've got some daisies. Now guys, there's different varieties of daisies. So some daisies will bloom like, you know, in June, some will, will bloom in spring, but these guys, I think these are called Montauk daisies and these guys bloom in the fall. So when everything else is kind of falling apart, everything's getting really brown. I've got a load of uh, these actually by my um, mailbox. So I've got a ton of Montauk daisies that are, you know, in full bloom right now. And I've got a ton of sedum out there. And someone said the other day, oh, I always know it's your house because you're the lady with the daisies. So I thought that was kind of cute. So we're like the fall daisy folks back here. And this is a very uh, fun fact. So this is um, a Rose of Sharon in the back. This is a profuse... Um, self-propagator. So Sheldon and I moved about 10 of these plants last, uh, last spring. Uh, the beginning of spring is also a great time to move your plants before things start to bloom. We had to move 10 of these because they took over the entire uh, front garden bed of this. And so we moved them. They're doing great. They make a beautiful border for where we wanted to put them on the farm. But look at what I'm seeing over here. Another one popped up and they're really beautiful. So if you want a plant that's kind of going to, you know, like be a huge self-propagator and you want to fill some space for like a really like, you know, small amount of money, then uh, then go for it. And here's like a little honeybee flying right in here, right on cue. So this is what the Rose of Sharon bloom looks like. And I think these may also be drought tolerant. So just a super plant that thrives on neglect would be that Rose of Sharon. And I feel the same way about peonies. Peonies are so beautiful, they're so spectacular, and I literally like ignore them. So this is another one of my peonies over here, and this guy's doing great. I'm gonna wait to cut back this peony because it's still green and the leaves are doing terrific, so I'm gonna let it continue to feed itself until it starts falling apart. But once those leaves start getting brown, uh, then I'll cut them back and I'll remove the leaves from the garden because I don't wanna get any kind of fungal issues. So that's the story with my peony plant back here. We've got a load of new hydrangeas that um, Proven Winners sent me. I'm going to show you all of those as they start to come into bloom in the spring. I love Proven Winners products. Um, I'm going to show you one right now that I really love. These are called Incredible. And so um, they sent me a few of these Incredible hydrangeas. These are the big, beautiful white snowball ones that um, 
These are the beautiful white snowball ones that turn green eventually, and um, they have sturdier stems than the Annabelle hydrangeas. So I've got a whole bunch of Annabelle hydrangeas in back, um, and I love them. They're really great, but you can tell like this, that the flower heads get super, super heavy, and then they start to flop. So the Incrediball is a similar hydrangea, but they have sturdier stems. So these guys just went in the ground this year. And they're already like doing really, really well. Like a lot of times you won't even keep the blooms or you won't even get blooms the first year that you put something in the ground. But these guys had like, you know, like three or four blooms on them. They're looking really pretty. What I might do is just give them like a little slight deadheading. I don't want to cut them back because I love all this green leaf growth on it. And I want those green leaves to continue to feed the plant to get that root system nice and strong for the winter because I wanted to come, I want it to come back super strong, you know, in the spring and summer of next year. So I'm not going to prune this guy back. And these blooms also come in on what's known as that new growth. So another nice thing about Incredible is that you don't have to worry about cutting it at the wrong time of year, uh, as long as you don't cut it in like spring because that's when those uh, new blooms are starting to come in. So they come in on that new growth. So that's a, a really, really uh, great plant to look at. So I think that's all the stuff I wanted to show you for today, guys. Um, please come say hi to us over on my Cranberry Fields Instagram channel. We're also on TikTok now. I have um, a TikTok channel. It's all this is in descriptions below. And I would love to see you over on my flower courses. And if you're looking for a great Christmas gift or Hanukkah gift or you know, Mother's Day or birthday gift, check out uh, my flower guides. Um, I think that uh, the gardeners in your life will really love them. I tried to choose the, my favorite uh, flowers that were the easiest to grow to tell you all about them. So, um, okay, guys, I'll see you guys soon, and I'll see you hopefully next Wednesday at 1030. I hope you can make that new time slot. Uh, so Wednesday is at 1030 from now on, and I will see you in the next video. And check out some of those hydrangea care tip videos, and um, sure thing. Sure thing, Z. I'll see you guys later.